What's the word learns the wider community? John O back at it again with an excellent presentation around a actually an excellent gift around a good brother named JB, James Baldwin. Just like in the tradition that we typically that we tradition that we do when it comes to these presentations, I need you to go ahead and grab that journal, a dictionary, pencils, crayons, and markers. We're gonna be taking a lot of notes and we're gonna learn, be learning a lot. It's a lot to be told about this good brother. Without further ado, I ain't gonna hold us long. Let's get straight to it. For the agenda today, we're gonna cover word bank, activity, biography, some major works by this brother. You know, what does this brother put out? What did he do? His impact today, then we're gonna have some reflection, some sources, then we're gonna close. For today's word bank, I need you to pause this video before you do. I need you to grab that journal, that writing instrument, and write at the top of your word bank, James Baldwin literacy moment. What are some of these words you about to, what, what are some of these terms that we need to uncover, these we need to unpack, that we need to understand? And so these three terms are gonna be palliation, then the Harlem Ren uh, uprising, Harlem uprising of 1943. Man, and the atheism. Mm, mm, mm. So go ahead and jot them words down and we're gonna get straight to the rest of the presentation. For the activity today, you know, traditionally if you follow the videos, if you watch the videos, you usually have like three questions. Today we're gonna to go light, we're gonna go with these two, these two but profound questions that uh, tie to any conversation around the good JB. How did homophobia mm, and racism mm, shape the experiences of black freedom fighters in the 20th century? And you go ahead and write that question down, do your research. You know, if you've got a computer, go ahead and do your own research on your computer, a tablet, a uh, book. Try to figure out, you know, and answer that question, that, that, that bold question. Then where does place and location, space, play a role in the development of members of the Black Freedom Movement? Mm -mm -mm. So you can answer this with a written response and an artistic response. You don't have to necessarily write out your answer to these questions, but uh, do give a response to these two things. Let me get right to it. So JB, James Baldwin. So James Baldwin, Baldwin's a Leo. You know how Leos are, how they can be uh, if you if you into you know that kind of stuff, astrology and stuff like that. He was born August second, nineteen twenty four. Now mind you, this is you know following the around. Uh, this is a period following the women getting the right to vote, uh, white women in particular getting the right to vote in 1919, 1920. This is also a time in which there is a, a lot of uh, pivotal steps being taken by everyday people, uh, particularly black people who are on the front lines of wrestling with Jim Crow. Because mind you, after, after the Civil War ends, then we have Reconstruction, and there's a deal made with the South and the North. So what ends up happening with, with South uh, and North leadership around political capacity and stuff like that, certain compromises, some deals were made to the detriment of the Black community. And so it's in this context that you know Jim Crow rises and James Baldwin, while he's not in the South, which is where traditionally when we think about Jim Crow, we think of you know uh, the... the, the uh, you know, Alabama, we think Virginia, we think South Carolina, we think of all these places in the South, but in the North and Harlem, there still very much so is overt and systemic racism that is plaguing the lives of everyday people. And so JB is born in Harlem in New York. And if you know anything about Harlem during this period, not only are folk wrestling with the political nature that has to deal with, you know, racism, um, on an economic level, on a, on a health level, healthcare level, um, on all these different fronts, Baldwin is also navigating a space that would later become and be known as the Harlem Renaissance. That could have been a term. I, that's a free one. I would look that up too. The Harlem Renaissance. And so, who was he born to? Who's his birth? Who's his mom? So, Baldwin was born to Emma Bertie Jones. And his biological father and his mother, they don't end up staying together. He ends up being raised pretty much by a Baptist preacher who um, happens to be, who is also his stepfather named David Baldwin. He's a Baptist minister. And so in this context, 
of course, uh, you know, James growing up with, you know, uh, you know, a, a father figure in his life, um, a mother who um, is invested pretty much in making sure that, you know, he's keeping his head on straight, he's staying focused. Um, his father, by being a Baptist minister, um, I'm pretty sure when it comes to, if you know anything about the Baptist church tradition, uh, those who are relatives of people who, of Baptist preachers and stuff like that, they have a real big emphasis on like literacy and making sure that folk are instilled with the values of writing and reading and things like that. And so that's kind of foreshadowing to a point I'm gonna get to later about JB. And so he has a really big, big family, right? So he has three younger brothers and he got five other sisters in the household, right? And so <clears throat> I'll get to why that's relevant in a minute. As I stated earlier, the influence of his stepfather led Baldwin to pursue um, not just reading and writing for reading and writing's sake, but also a relationship that was intimate when it came to the church. And so Baldwin ended up becoming a junior minister at Fireside Pentecostal Assembly. And this is at the age of 14 to 17. So we're talking about 1930. Mm, about 1930s, 1940s, uh, Baldwin is immersed in the experience of the organized religion. He ends up later attending Frederick Douglass High School. And while at this high school, his literary, his, his literary and create, creative capacity comes out in the way in which he participates in organized life in school. And so he ends up writing a school song for like the, the school song it ends up becoming a yearly annual uh, centerpiece of that school's tradition until the school closes at Frederick Douglass High School. He later, he later transitions to Duet Clinton High School where he edited the Magpie magazine. Now, while he editing this magazine and stuff, he ends up also becoming into con coming into contact with some peers who are also at the school. You know, you got, you got school, you got other people in the school that are with you. And so one of the, the people that he ends up, ends up coming in contact with is County Cullen, right? And so if, for those who don't know who County Cullen is, I would look him up. He's also a legendary figure in the black radical tradition as it pertains to art, um, but also the black freedom movement. And this is at, all by the age of 18. Now I'm gonna take a step back real quick and kind of revisit Baldwin's experience with being a, a junior minister within the church house. So in navigating that space, uh, Baldwin felt that the church was hypocritical on many levels. He felt that the ways in which the gospel was being preached, the gospel was being talked about, all these different things weren't necessarily reflected, I guess, in the church's relationship to community, right? And that's without me knowing exactly what the dynamics were of the of organized space that Baldwin participated in, but these are realities that he had to wrestle with and deal with. And so his father unfortunately passes away after he completes high school. Now, mind you, uh, this is a time in which, you know, uh, educational opportunities uh, beyond the uh, traditional K-12 experience and stuff like that are used to create avenues and create possibilities for folk navigating just the everyday in America to be able to provide for their family. And so when his father passed away, when his father passed away, Baldwin ended up put, being put in a position where he had to play a father role to, or he, he perceived himself to be playing a father role to his siblings, right? And so, you know, the pressure and the amount of, uh, you know, promised the pressure to deliver a pro the promises of being able to provide basic needs you know I'm talking about shelter clothes food water things like that for his siblings at a young age mind you he's only 19 around 19 when this happens but that doesn't stop life from happening that doesn't stop america from being america you have the harlem uprising of 1943 and so this was a case in point in which as you when you explore just the uprisings that are happening during the period of the 1940s, 1950s, 1930, like 1930s, um, all these things, like I said earlier, in response to black folk being treated unfairly, being treated unjustly due to Jim Crow, due to uh, the ways in which uh, systemic racism 
impacts their everyday. And so an example of this is, and Baldwin witnesses this, an example of this is when a police officer ends up shooting and wounding a, a soldier, someone who served in the military had gave, literally put his body on the line to participate and lift up the ideals of a country and to fight for, you know, uh, patriotism, all these different things that folk are inundated with and taught and told to be proud of all these different things. And so that angered the black community when word got around that people thought he was dead. Not only had he been shot, but they thought he was dead. They thought he was killed, that he was murdered. And so this led to an uprising. So James is, you know, he, he's, he's witnessing all these things happening and in his mind, he's hoping that of course, there's justice, there's fairness in play, but then he starts to really come to terms with in his adolescent to uh, adult years. And, yeah, it's, it's from his adolescent to adult years, just the hypocrisy, not only of his, his feelings towards the church, but also to America. Just be what you say you're going to be on paper. That's all James is saying. Be what you gonna say you're going to be on paper. You can't be in a position of authority and abuse that position of authority to your own benefit because of your prejudices, because of your, uh, because of, you know, you believing you're superior to another individual. You know, America talks about certain uh, things in the constitution that Baldwin is reading and he's looking at, because remember he's an avid reader, avid writer. And he said, you're not living up to that. And that's a problem. So the, there's the Harlem Renaissance, the, the, uh, there's the Harlem uprising of, of 43. Around this time, Baldwin, he has all this, these thoughts in his head, he has all these emotions in his head, he has all these, these, he's wrestling with his blackness, he's wrestling with, you know, struggling to provide for his family, he's wrestling with all these different pressures, these stresses of life. And he ends up meeting another prolific uh, artist, creative, writer, uh, American, like savant when it comes to that paper uh, in Richard Wright. And so I could, we cover, we already know about Richard Wright though. We cover Richard Wright and, and the other Zawadi. And if you haven't checked that out, go ahead and check that out. But Richard Wright ends up taking Baldwin under his wing and Baldwin ends up learning a lot from Richard Wright and by nature of their relationship, Richard Wright ends up taking Baldwin to an opportunity wherein he's able to receive a fellowship. Now this fellowship that he receives leads to his first novel called Go Tell It on the Mountain. If you haven't read that book, if you, if you haven't heard that book, go get your life, go get, you, go get your issue, go ahead and check it out. And so this is at the ages between 24 and 33 when Baldwin is in Paris, he's, he's uh, writing, he's doing what he love to do, what he do, whether told to or not to, he's doing what he love to do. While in Paris, he ends up meeting a legendary St. Louis named Maya Angelou. And so they connect and they both talking about, they just both talking, they talk like, yeah, I'm in Paris, I'm in Paris. And like, yeah, it's, it's terrible at home. Like the, even the experiences that they're having in their blackness in, in France is different from the experiences they're having in their home country, being America. And so they're connecting, they, they vibe and they talking about everything that's going on. And Baldwin continues to travel and is a movement to Istanbul, Turkey. But while he's in Turkey, he's still moving around, right? He, he has the luxury of, is being able to go from place to place to place to place. And he ends up uh, engaging in several uh, moments that are critical within the larger experience of American development, right? When we talk about the Black freedom movement, we talk about Black resistance, Black uh, struggle in a certain kind of way. And so an example of this is he attended the March on Washington. He ended up you know, participating in direct actions in Selma, so Montgomery. And in the midst of this, he's also been able to network with, build relationship with, deepen ties with individuals who are in the same, uh, on the same sheet of music when it comes to critiquing America, call, calling out the ills of America, calling out the things that America, out of love, because out of love, we, out of love for the ideals and the principles that sound good, but what does it look like in practice? These are the things that Black uh, black freedom fighters are wrestling with during this moment in which Baldwin, you know, is, is navigating his own writings. And so he ends up having a debate with Malcolm X. You should check out that debate if you, uh, it, it was in the spring, I believe, September of 63. 
And this is two years before the tragic uh, murder of Malcolm X. And so in that debate with Malcolm X, you know, he's they're talking about and they're critiquing direct action, talking about best practices, talking about things that help improve certain uh, ways and theories and and and, and uh, applications of how to you know navigate the problems that they have identified. Because one thing to identify an issue, it's another thing to actually do something about it, right? And there are different ways. To, there are different ways to skin a potato. Like you don't have to do it one way; you can do it another way. But the potato gotta be skinned. And so Baldwin ends up really going through an emotional, psychological, and mental breakdown in response to the death of those who have become to have come to be known as his as his fellow revolutionaries, right? And so mind you, I said that he had a debate with Malcolm X in 63. In 65, Malcolm X is murdered. And he participated in the direct actions in Selma. He also participated in the direct actions in uh, on the March on Washington for jobs and justice, stuff like that. Baldwin is, witnesses the murder of Malcolm X. He witnesses the murder of Martin Luther King in 68. Malcolm X passes, is murdered in 65. Martin Luther King is murdered in 68. He also witnesses the murder of Mega Evers, right? If you don't know anything about Mega Evers, he was an individual who was also a black freedom fighter um, based in the South, I believe, maybe Mississippi. Charges to my mind, not my heart. But he's witnessing all this, this, these individuals who he had real life relationships with just be murdered, right? And so all the experiences he's had since he's a child from experiencing Jim Crow to experiencing uh, the ways in which society uh, chooses to demonize uh, black families, demonize black youth, uh, tell them they're not worth anything, treat them like animals, stuff like that. And then try to be and to be in concert with people who are trying to do something and who believe in change, who believe in different tactics of going about it, but believe in actually transforming community in a certain kind of way. And though even they are being, you know, targeted, being uh, attacked, being disregarded. And so James Baldwin ends up settling in Saint Paul de Vence, Saint Paul de Vence. France, I'm um, by the age of 47. And in the ninth, when he's about, um, I want to say about in the 1980s and 70s, uh, I, I, the interview, I'm not sure if it took place at his home or if it took in, in St. Paul de Vence or if it took place, uh, you know, wherever in South France where uh, Baldwin had a, settled as a, as a resident. He had homes in the, in the, in the U.S. that he could have been at, but he preferred obviously to be in France. And so there he's doing this interview, he's sitting down with this interview and the interview is, is, you know, talking to him about just his experiences as it pertains to, you know, why he decided to move out of the US, why he decided to say, I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with, you know, American politics. I'm not dealing with, I, like I, in proximity, me being in location and having to wrestle with certain things, I'm not gonna deal with that. And James explains that, when he was in his experience in the rearings of America, he literally said that the police would threaten him, you know, try to kill him, stuff that other black families and youth were going through, right? Like this is not unique to him. But he also said that when he was a child, like part of why he wanted to move to Paris, why he wanted to move to France, is, be, is it because he um, was LGBTQ, he was, he was, uh, he, he was how much he, he identified as homosexual, he was also picked on by people, young people in his community, families in his community. So he couldn't find solace and reprieve and he couldn't find uh, a sense of peace from his own people because he was gay. And he couldn't find peace, of course, with uh, his, his own people, even though they have a trauma relationship, they have a bond, they have a relationship in terms of, you know, wrestling with the uh, overt racist and the attacks and the beatings and the and the drama coming from uh, systemic racism by way of the police, by way of the state, but by way of all these areas of violence. And so that's just a thought to be left on when it comes to JB. Shout out to JB, you know, that the literary giant, you know what I'm saying, with, with the with the off guard look. Yeah, serious visage. Yeah, yeah, because I know I'm funny. Yeah. 
he unfortunately passes in November 3rd on November 3rd 87 at the age of 63. Yeah, that that giant that giant. And this is mind you my this this is following the complete the the beginnings of, you know, crazy right wing development within the within America as a backlash to the uprisings happening in response to the murder of those who were friends of James Bar of James Baldwin, like Michael Max, Martin Luther King, Mega Evers, and those names that we that we will never know and would never look up because we don't know. James Baldwin could be. So major works. If Bill Street could talk. So this is a film that was published in, this, this, this is not a film, this is a novel. This is one of the novels, many, many, one of the many literary works that James Baldwin worked on throughout his life. If Bill Street Could Talk ended up coming out in 1974, right? And this is, of course, you know, maybe about 10, 11 years after the murder of Michael Max. This is, you know, James Baldwin sitting and wrestling with, you know, how to talk, tell stories, how to write narratives about black life black the black human experience from a perspective that isn't just grounded in the trauma the terror the death dread and despair that comes with navigating life as a uh, black person in america as a black youth black family family in america and so it's a story about a protagonist named fawny um and his his the mother of his child named tish fawny ends up being falsely accused of raping a white woman and it tells a story while that's a point that is sharp in the in, in the text in the novel the larger piece is about really uh affection care love and things like that right and so Baldwin tries to capture of course life events that are happening but that you have to go through the every day and as a person writing during this period in which he's he survived all these different things happening around him with uh his family and as a as a young person to you know the church to what's happening with uh you know you know quote unquote black leadership being targeted being uh this uh being assaulted being murdered being uh communities uprising all these different things he's talking about love in this context and so here's a quote from that text People don't believe it about boys and girls that age. People don't believe much, and I'm beginning to know why. But then we got to be friends, or maybe. And it's really the same thing, something else people don't want to know. I got to be his little sister, and he got to be my big brother. He didn't like his sisters, and I didn't have any brothers. And so we got to be for each other what the other missed. Mm, 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 ain't that cute? So this is a conversation Baldwin puts on paper when it comes to this conversation between Fonny and Tish, the characters I told you about the novel earlier, when it comes to Fonny and Tish when they were young people, right? This is before they, you know, they, they knew they grew up uh, together, uh, when, you know, platonically in love and stuff like that. It wasn't like, you know, when they get, when they get to where it gets to when you get older, but, you know, it was a platonic situation which they jailed together, even in the midst of everything happening. Mind you, you know, the period in which this is happening, of course, we have state sanctioned violence happening, right? We have people being concerned, but in the, that's down the line in the, in the narrative of the story, but in the midst of crisis happening, in the midst of, uh, of, of, of unchecked, un, unchecked unruliness when it comes to authority, these young people are carefree, free thinking in, in their own bodies, you know, thinking about each other, leaning on each other, supporting each other, and that's beautiful. Check out Bill, if Bill Street could talk if you, uh, get the opportunity to i highly encourage it even if you don't have time to read the text i haven't even read the text uh but even if you have the opportunity to just see the film the film is 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 so critical it's powerful yes 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 but you know they had a film and if you did know if you didn't know now you know if you don't know now you know impact today so whoo perseverance so being centered in your purpose is critical to any kind of work that you do in this revealed in JB's uh, his story and his experience, right? And so, in the midst of all the hell, of, of all the all the the trauma, all the all the issues happening around, all the problems happening around him, he doesn't allow himself to be flimsy like a paper and just you know, like that, 
right? He's like a tube. He stays strong. He doesn't bend or he doesn't bow to anything that would pertain to the pressures of growing up as a young Black writer during this period in time. And so it's important when we talk about today, when you have stuff like the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic going on and people losing their loved ones, they're losing people close and special to them, that folk remember to stay grounded in their purpose and put one foot in front of the other. Next piece is free thinking, right? And so it's so much temptation to, you know, for folk to be on the same kind of wavelength with each other and stuff like that. And there's no, there's lack of creativity, there's lack of independence. I think folk are just out of a sense of, you know, how to think about navigating creativity in a certain kind of way. And part of that is tied to how we think about the everyday, right? Baldwin could have easily wrote, and matter of fact, he got into it with his mentor, uh, Richard Wright. I didn't get to this in biography, but Baldwin could have wrote, so he was blue in the face about how angry he was about certain things. He could have wrote only about death, only about uh, black pain and black anger and stuff like that. He did write about that, but he also took time to write a text like if Bill Street could talk, right? A text about love, about care, right? About affection, right? That's a part, that's part and parcel part and parcel to the fact that the human experience is not monolithic. You can't just live in one space. And so don't conform to, don't, don't conform, don't be, so don't subscribe to conformity, create your own tradition in the context of the larger experience of navigating death, dread, and despair that is brought on by the state. And the last piece is Kuji Chakalia. Kuji Chakalia. Swahili for self-determination. And so Baldwin, when he was, you know, navigating uh, what it meant to be, uh, you know, himself, he didn't cower to, you know, the pressures of homophobia. He didn't cower to the pressures of racism. He didn't cower to the pressures of, of all these different things that really can cripple and break down and discourage the everyday person, right? Instead, he allowed himself to create his own narrative, his own story, right? As Black leadership was being murdered and targeted, he didn't use that, he, he, didn't, he didn't see that and experience that and go cold and go numb, right? Instead, he used that, and though he, of course, ended up moving to St. Paul de Vence, France, to wrestle with certain things, right? To be in isolation, to make sure that he was able to have a level of time for self and self nurturing and self development. Baldwin was not a part of a narrative of, you know, going back to that idea of free thinking of conformity, right? He knew that it was important that he named for himself what needed to happen for himself, for him, his family, for his people. And so nothing but the utmost respect for that good brother, James Baldwin. And, you know, as you see right here, this is perseverance, free thinking and self determined nation illustrated you know back in the day they didn't have you know the, the the fat back uh windows pcs they didn't have the you know the the, the macbook laptops and stuff you know just had this little copier thing for you know you you know for the young people who you know were wondering what is that big clunky machine on that desk you know and he had a thing for cardigans and, and buttoned up shirts i see yeah yeah jb y'all so these some sources But before we get to the sources, reflection. So that was intensive. That was intense. You know, we talk about JB, we talk about these, these gifts of Black history, these deep, the Zawadis of Black history. It's important that, you know, we take our time with them and we appreciate just their sacrifices, their contributions, their, uh, you know, relevance, not only to what's happened when they were alive, but also how that happens today. And so I need you to do three things for them. I need you to artistically or write a prompt write a prompt or artistically illustrate some things you learned about JB from this presentation. And then when you're done, take a picture of it with your journal and send it to zawadi at gmail.com. You can put learn Zawadi your initials. And then when I'm out promoting, of course, the next gifts that we have, the next uh, series that we have, the next person that's coming up, because I got a treat for y'all for this next one, this next one gonna be, yeah, you thought this was it, yeah, yeah. JB a bad, a bad man, wait till this next one come out. Go ahead, go ahead and send that to me uh, to, you know, show this what, what things you wrestle with and we'll go from there.
Here are some sources. I want to give thanks again to you for watching this Learn Zawadi video, this, this, this Zawadi, this gift on James Baldwin. I want to give special gratitude, of course, to all my Patreon and YouTube subscribers and viewers as we continue to navigate and to lift up the importance and significance and, and the power that is in reflecting, studying, and, and, and writing and lifting up the those who have come before us, those who have laid the foundation, right, for our development and our growth when it comes to understanding the role of Black people within the development of, of America. I want to thank and give special gratitude to uh, Brother Celine, Brother Ebinger, Sister Colin, and definitely Dr. Berman. So, now that you watch this, go ahead and share that gift. I need you to go ahead and share this gift, the gift of Black history, the gift that is, uh, uh, you know, Black studies, the gift of James Baldwin. If you haven't seen the previous video that was on sister, the sister, the, the Black revolutionary and, 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 and courageous uh, queen in Asada Shakur, go ahead and check her out. And you'll be in for a treat for the next one. I want to thank you for checking us out. It's Jono. Stay tuned.